Courtside Conversations. Courtside Conversations. The Roland Garros Tennis Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Courtside Conversations, the official Roland Garros podcast. My name is Gigi Salmon and together with special guests, we're going to be keeping you company throughout the year. We like to think of it as tennis with a French twist, the second Grand Slam of the year, never too far from our thoughts. And I am delighted to say that with me today, this is a long list of achievements, Grand Slam champion, former world number seven, coach, broadcaster, interviewer, wife and mother, and I've probably left off loads. Marion Bartley, welcome to the podcast. Oh, Gigi, you're too nice with me. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure uh, to be reunited once again with you. And yes, the list is keeping going on and on <laughs> and for more and more. But it's all great chances that I have to uh, explore yeah. new opportunities that I have in my job. And I'm really fortunate to also meet amazing people along the way and to work with them just that we are doing today together. So, um, so it's all great. And thank you so much once again for having me. And I do get the feeling, though, that you you like to be... You like to be busy and you like to juggle and work across lots of different things. So, yeah, absolutely. No, I love to, to be busy. Um, for me, I always take it as a chance to, to explore a um, new version of myself, to learn also something new, which I'm doing every day. For example, when I'm coaching the two kids I'm working with um, to see now how 13 and 14 years old are functioning compared to what I used to do myself when I was 13 and 14, um, obviously working for... Uh, broadcasters, whether it's commentating matches, analyzing matches, going on the court and doing an on-court interview of a player just won the match and you want to try to gather those emotions and put the best out of those emotions to the public that is in the stadium at that moment. Um, so it's all of that I really embrace. And absolutely some days I just want to quit everything and don't <laughs> hear any noise and just be by myself on a beach and do nothing at all. But usually that doesn't last more than two days. After two days, I'm like, hmm. I'm getting a little <laughs> bit bored. Let me try and do something something different and something more. So uh, I do have a bit of those days, but usually it doesn't have more than 48 hours. <laughs> now, as this is the official Roland Garros podcast, what about Roland Garros? Why is it such a special tournament for you? It, it might be a moment when you were playing. It, it might be a memory. It's actually my first memory of going to a huge event with my parents. Um, so we have a tradition just very much like in the UK with Wimbledon is, you know, you gather the family together, you come with the kids for one day at Roland Garros. And obviously I was living a very, very small village in France. So already the travel to go from that place to Paris is such an adventure. You go by car, it's six hour drive. Um, you know, you stop on the motorway, you go for uh, having your drinks and your sandwich, and then you go again and you arrive finally in Paris and you see the massive Eiffel Tower and the Arc de Triomphe, and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, as a child, you're really, really dreaming. So I was eight years old, I was with my brother, and both of us had a sort of autograph book, and we were printing the picture of our favorite players, just putting the picture right in that page and trying to get the autograph matching the picture. So obviously back then, our sort of aim was Steffi Graf, Boris Becker, Andre Agassi, Monica Seles, um, Michael Chang, Sergi Bruguera, and we were trying to chase them, see where they were practicing, staying in the practice court for like hours and hours to see who was coming to practice and try to get that autograph at the end. Um, and sort of competing with my brother, who would get the most autograph at the end of the day. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I remember that vividly. And that was for me the best memories because obviously you're a child. Um, everything looks so dreamy and so gigantic. When I, when now I look at Ron Garros, I'm like, how I remember looking at that you know, Place des Mousquetaires and thinking it's so enormous. And now I look at it, I'm like, this is so tiny. <laughs> so you, you look at it in different perspective. But every time I'm crossing those gates at Roland Garros and I see the Cour Philippe Chatrier and the Cour Cézanne Anglais, I have the flashback of myself at eight years old trying to chase those top players and get an autograph. And that's why I'm trying as much as possible to sign all the autographs that people are asking me even now. Because I remember being myself in that position and, and being so happy um, to be able to show that at my parents at the end of the day. So I'm trying to remember that kid inside of me. No, I love it. It's such a special memory. We've just seen so much of that at the Australian Open. Children hanging those overinflated balls on the caps Absolutely. and anything to get those signatures. And they had an extra day to do it because it was the first Sunday start. We still ended up having some very late finishes. It's, we had a new Grand Slam champion. So many storylines. 
But if Marion, someone came up to you and they hadn't, we're going to go through it. But if someone said to you, I didn't see it, I didn't hear anything about it. How would you sum up the first Grand Slam of the year? Um, I would sum up being definitely with a lot of upsets. Novak Djokovic being the biggest, absolutely. Uh, it was the biggest headlines because with his record at, uh, at the Australian Open, I would say the equivalency of seeing Rafa losing on clay. You know, that was as big as an headline. So um, that was very special. Um, having Danin Medvedev being against two sets to love up on that exact same court in the exact same stage of the tournament, just against a different player, and not seeing him crossing the line and the winner was heartbreaking because one, I mean, when you have been a player yourself and you know how much it means to win a Grand Slam and you know what it feels to be so close, it's two sets slow up and the match just start off slipping out of your hands and you can't get the control back, it's absolutely awful. So as an ex tennis player, I can, you know, feel what Daniel is feeling right now and I feel sad for him. Um, on the women's draw, you had a total domination of Arena Zabalenka, like something we rarely see on the women's tour, we put it that way. You usually see a Grand Slam champion coming through, but they have some top three setters. They have maybe sometimes two save made match points or they're done in the match and somehow they find a way. But to see a total dominance like this, you probably have to go back to Serena Williams in her best years. Um, so for me, that was that was definitely something yeah, quite special to witness. Um, you had the return of the moms, the return of Angie Kerber, the return of Naomi Osaka. So that was, um, I think that's something extraordinary and such a strong message going through. And then that was, I mean, usually the nickname of the Australian Open is the happy slime. And I think this year more than ever, that was definitely the happy slime. You can see the atmosphere in the crowd was just literally out of the roof for any players. You know, we had some amazing French support. Um, in terms of the French players like uh, Arthur Cazzo, like Adrian Manarino. Um, you had obviously the Australian rooting for Demi Noor and all the, the Australian players. Um, for me to see that many people crossing the gates, still loving tennis, still loving the atmosphere, still loving to sit with their kids in the stadium for the whole day. Uh, I think it's just to show how much tennis is in such in a healthy position um, in terms of fans and, and fan gatherings. And you mentioned the French fans. I happened in qualifying to go and watch Hugo Gaston playing. He would lose in the third round, but he would get in as a lucky loser. I found myself on the court. The French support was crazy. It was wonderful. I don't remember in recent years the French support being quite like it was this year. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. When even I was watching on TV and um, we had Adrian Manarino going quite deep. I mean, that match against Bell Shelton was just wild and why you almost felt you went wrong Garros, to be fair which is the surface was different but the support adrian was getting was absolutely crazy and i think he admitted himself just it's just lifting you i mean when you feel you're a little down you're a little tired it's a fifth set it's a long match to you get the adrenaline that, that rush so much for your body because of the support it helps you to keep on going um to some limits that you felt that was far before that that was your it and uh, and that helps you to push that along along further during the road. But for me to see Arthur Caso being so young and playing his first Australian Open and just coming out of the block and beating Olga Rune, uh, they play against each other in the juniors and now he's beating him in the biggest stage in the Grand Slam. That was absolutely something great. We had one woman in the second week as well in Océan Dodin. Um, so I think for us in the French tennis, that was probably one of the happy slams we got since really quite a while. Obviously, we were expecting Karin Garcia to go maybe a little further, but, you know, the numbers we were able to put through, whether it was the third round or the round of 16, is something that we haven't seen from quite a while. And of course, we used to do better when Amelie, for example, won in 2006. Of course, we had some amazing years when Joey Fitzsong was the final in 2008. But for now, as where we stand, it was one of the best results we got from quite a long time. And to see the atmosphere and the French um, being so happy and cheering so loudly all the French players was was so great. Yeah, no, the sport was absolutely amazing. I want to look at both the draws, starting on the WTA side. And I want to start with Irina Sabalenka. She, she smashed her way through the draw. And before we speak about her, just to have a listen to the Australian Open champion talking about her emotions and how she felt coming in as defending champion. 
you're super excited. It's still emotional of the court, but as soon as I step in on the court, I felt like, okay, I think I'm in control and I think I'm emotionally ready ready for it you know so and compared to the last year um it's it's completely different me um compared to the use open once again it's different me I, I, i'm as i said um, more controlled and uh, and uh kind of like don't let the rest of the things come to my mind and i was focusing on myself so i think it's a big difference marion she was she was practically faultless across the two weeks absolutely Gigi, she was and for me to see her dominating the rest of the field, the way she did, uh, it's something we haven't seen in recent years in the Grand Slams. Um, across any surface with any winners, um, even Iga Schwantek at Roland Garros, sometimes she has to go through a three-setter, sometimes she has one match when she's mm -hmm. a lot more challenged. This year, I mean, for Arena, the toughest match for her was against Coco in the semifinal, uh, and because it was a replay of the final of the US Open, obviously. Um, so that's where she was slightly more pushed than the other matches. But even that, you could feel she had that slight upper edge. And with that very aggressive attacking game, she was able to control most of the say of the match. And um, and as she said, I mean, the US Open, it's really the, the, she led the crowd and the support for Coco just getting under her skin. And then she was emotionally so overwhelmed that she couldn't even hit the ball anymore. Um, and she was committing so many unforced errors. But for her... I was actually reading an article about her fitness coach that was explaining that as much as it's about getting her physically ready it's as well as getting her emotionally ready. And they have a ways of um, sort of getting some data of her sleeping and, and the way she functioned during the days to help her see where she stands emotionally. And if sometimes they have to pull down in the practice because it's just she's getting sort of too much emotionally high and too fatigued and there is no reason to push or she's in a great level and they can push even more in the practice and get her even more fit. So I found it really interesting to read that because a lot of times when you listen to the coaches, it's only about the technique and the tactics and the fitness, but it's not as much as the emotions and the control of the emotions. It can be the mental, but the mental is just a wide word that can include so many things. Um, and I feel, especially on the woman's side, it's a lot about how you feel inside and how you're um, sensing the exteriors and how you can control that. And when you feel the, the surroundings is sort of an aggression, it's starting to become very, very difficult to stay calm and, and go through what you have to go through on the court and execute what you have to execute. And I think very much for Arena, I think it's a sort of sensitive woman. If she can get that at bay and control that, that's where she played her best. So I found that article very interesting because they definitely identify the issue and they've been able to find a way to solve those issues. And that's what a great team is able to do is sometimes you go through an experience and you can't at the moment deal with it and find a solution. But if you're able to do not repeat the same error, that's already a plus and that's already a bonus. And that was very much the case for her uh, this year at the Australian Open. You mentioned her fitness coach, Jason Stacey, and you mentioned the team as a whole. I don't know if you were superstitious, but for the two weeks before every match, he has a bald head. They they wrote on his head, they played knots and crosses on it one day. Now he said, I'm not sure I like this, but if we can get the win as a team, I, I will do this. And for me, it, it showed another side. It showed that they are having fun. And it's so important in such a stressful situation that you have the right people around you. Absolutely. I found it actually quite hilarious because you could see on the picture all those <laughs> I mean, things I was writing on his head. I think even sometimes on the side of his ears. And definitely when you're filmed at the coach, that's probably not what the, the image you want to put out of yourself out there. But I mean, as long as it works. But I think, as you say, they're able to have a sort of, I would say, sense of having fun with themselves and not taking themselves very seriously. When you look at the video they post before the Australian Open with the dance they're doing on the court, I mean, it's, you can see it's serious, but sometimes it's fun enough to keep going. And, and you know, sometimes on the, year, on the tour, the years since very long, and, and you go through the exact same tournament over and over and over again. And it's just about trying to repeat the same results over and over and over again. So you need to find that sparkle, you know, because otherwise it becomes lonely, it becomes very routine, and, and you just lose that enthusiasm. And once you lose that enthusiasm, it's very, very difficult to go and perform. 
Um, and that's why for me, what Novak Djokovic has been able to do over the years, it's just, it just beyond extraordinary. But I think especially for the girls, if you can find a little bit of fun here and there without losing too much of the concentration, that's definitely the magic formula. And that's definitely the magic recipe. And I was actually seeing her as well in some of her warmer routines. She was um, having some inflated balloon and she was playing with them. And obviously the balloon is very light, so it travels quite quick in the air. And it's just switching things around. You know, you don't feel like you do ex the exact same thing every single day because that's where the board is coming. And, and you want to keep things light, fun and entertaining as well as obviously being professional and, and focused into the results. So the headlines, and rightly so, all about Irina Sabalenka. But you have to feel that a star is born in Zheng Xin Wen. She is 21 years of age. Yes, of course, there are things can be improved on. She's young. She's back with Per Reba for a, for a second spell. She looks very settled. And, and what a wonderful character she is, both on and off the court. You know, it's funny, Gigi, because at the end of last year, a common broadcaster we worked together for asked me my prediction for the top 10 at the end of the year. And I put her straight away in there. Um, I saw her play for the first time. It was two years ago in Dubai. At the, there is sort of ITF tour level at the end of the year in December that a lot of girls are playing just before going to Australia. She lost first round. She was hitting the ball like crazy hard, but she was putting everything that much out. And I say to my husband, look, if she puts everything that much in, <laughs> She's going to be really, really good very, very soon. And and you could tell the potential. You could tell um, the work ethic already. You could tell the, the shots mm -hmm. she was possessing. It was a matter of just controlling all that power, controlling um, yeah, the way she hit the ball, the way she was striking the ball. She almost had too much power. And um, and then all of a sudden, you know, she was already in the top 50 so quickly. She challenged um, Elena Rybakina, the year that Elena won Wimbledon, she she lost only 7-6, 7-6. Everyone didn't really pay attention to that result because it was on the round of 16, but you could tell she was already knocking at the door. And, uh, and obviously the Australian Open with the history of Lina winning there. Um, we, we know there is a big Chinese influence in the Australian Open. They have actually a Chinese sponsor as well. So I think for the, for the Australian Open, it was already also very important that Chinese players do very well because it's just keep on having a lot more attention into the tournament from, from the press to the fans, attendants, et cetera, et cetera. So for her to actually have that breakthrough in that tournament is also going to help her to have that big attention coming into her, which I think she massively deserves. Yeah, I, I also, like you, have got her in, in the top eight to finish the year. I just think she's, she's just a very special player. The other players, in terms of ones to watch out for, you've got to look at the young players. They don't have any fear. Mira Andreva, Linda Noskova, Maria Timofeva, who came through qualifying. Look, Coco Goff is still a teenager, but these, these young players are stepping out onto the court with the belief that they can get the results. Absolutely. And, and obviously for us, um, French for Mira Andreva, it was a little bit painful because she was down 5-1 and match point against uh, Jan Parry and Jan Parry couldn't close out that match. And we're like, ugh. You know, we could have had another girl through, but <laughs> but she she has been, I mean, she has been extraordinary already last year. When she reached uh, the second week at Wimbledon, she was up against Madison Key. She could have made even the quarterfinal. Um, she's, it seems for her that everything is so easy and everything seems, um, you know, that there is no big deal. And, and she's going to step on the court and beat everyone. Um, she actually came to play in Abu Dhabi, um, sort of, a world team league event, um, which Arena Zabalenka played as well, before uh, going down under. And, and she was playing against the top players in the world like like it's a training for her. You know, she she had a sense of nothing bother her, no pressure being on the court. She just go and take off her business. She's very complete already, maybe lacking a tiny bit of power if he, she wants to compete against Coco, all those top, top, top players that are just knocking the ball probably a little bit harder than her. But... Her consistency, her movement, um, the way she uses the court, her ability to to feel what she has to do. She reminds me tactically a lot about Martina Hingis, um, the way she sees the court. Or Agnieszka Radvanska, you know, those people are just have radars everywhere, and they're just able to place the ball when it's the most accurate and the most efficient. And um, so she's extraordinary for Timo Feva, Absolutely an amazing run through. She beat Caroline Wozniacki. She beat Beatrice Adenmaia coming out of the qualities. Um, I think for me, even seeing Marta Kostiuk finally sort of using her potential, you know, being out there, being into the quarterfinals, Diana Jastremska as well, being into the semifinal, 
coming out, being first into qualification. She was hoping to be so badly into the main draw by herself and by her ranking. All of a sudden, you see number one to the qualities and you have to battle for already three matches before you get into the main draw. And she made it all the way to the semifinal. Now she's back into the top 30. So you had really some stories of either super young girls are coming through or people that we felt like four or five years ago, that would be the next big thing. They had a little bit of a letdown, but that Australian Open was for them the big major push through and they're, they're back where they, I believe they belong and even more for, for Kostiuk and Yastremska. So it was great to see, but at the end, um, you know, the girl that was supposed to win won. Now, when I think back to the first Roland Garros podcast I did with Alex Korecha, we spoke ahead of the Australian Open a lot about Novak Djokovic. Going for title number 11 in Australia, he was the player to beat. And I know he was battling a viral illness through the tournament. And you talked about the shock at the start, but how surprised were you with his loss to Yannickson? But not just the loss, but how straightforward it was for the Italian. Um, I think surprise is another statement. I was completely shocked. Um, it was just for two sets, it was not Novak on the court. I've never seen him play like that before in my whole life, even in some small tournaments when you felt, okay, maybe it's not the same motivation on a Grand Slam. He was playing better than this. For two sets, he was just not present on that court. Um, so that leads me to sort of two implications. One is even for Novak, when he's not at his best, it's very difficult to play. So, you know, as a coach, for example, when you're coaching young kids, you show them and say, well, look, even for the top of the top players, if your legs are not functioning, you just can't play tennis. And and that was showing so much for Novak. He was just late on the ball, not adjusting himself, not able to defend, which is the core of his game. So if you take that away from him, you can see that he can't play. And second, I think for me, that's going to awaken again the beast inside him. because. When you look at the final of Wimbledon that he should have won and he lost to Carlos, after that, it was flawless. And he went on, he won Cincinnati, he won the US Open, he won Bercy, he won the Masters. Um, so I think for me, that was sort of the wake-up call he needed at that moment of his career to say, hang on, I just don't want to finish like this in some sort of ways. I just don't want to finish in saying, I'm going to lose in the semis, or I'm going to lose in the quarters, and the young guns are going to take over, and it's just going to slip out of my hands like that. So I think he's going to pro- probably practice double, make double efforts to make sure that he finishes in his own terms. Um, based on what he said on his press conference after the match, maybe 2024 is his last year, because he said, I hope and I wish I can have a chance to be back at the Australian Open. If you're, if you're reading a little bit between the lines and you know the psychology of a player, if you already said that, if you, if you use the word, I hope, that means there is a big doubt. And if you listen to my speech in, in Wimbledon in 2013, I said, I hope I will see you next year. And the same wording. When you use the word, I hope, that means that there is a ma- massive question mark. So I think it's going to be give it, it absolute all for Roland Garros Wimbledon, the Olympics. And I don't even know that he thinks what he's going to do after that. Um, so that's going to be fascinating to see what will be his preparation and how he's going to get himself ready for the three back-to-back events are major, major before the end of his career. It's a big year for this generation. When you think Rafa Nadal and you think Andy Murray, and now we talk about Novak Djokovic. Someone we are going to see back in Australia is Yannick Sinner. Now for him, that was his third win against Novak Djokovic in nine weeks, including leading Italy to Davis Cup glory. What is it for you that stands out about the Italian? Um, for me, he has improved massively on two elements of his game. I would say three. His backhand, his game to come towards the net more, and his physicality. The way he moves side to side and his, a- his ability to go a lot longer in a match. And before against Sinner, even at the US Open, if you look at the way he played that event, Against Vavrinka, he had some massive dips. So he was able to win, but there is some set when he's just not present. The serve doesn't function anymore. You can see physically he's slowing down massively. And then it's quite easy to hit through him. And he lost against Zverev for the exact same reason, but Zverev obviously 
being now a better player than Vavrinka, he was able to capitalize on some on those downs. Um, I would say since Torino and then the Davis Cup and then the Australian Open, you can see that those downs are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, and if there is any. Obviously, the first two sets of the final, he was quite not present from, I would say, until 6 3 5 one. Uh, and Daniil was able to just hit through him and, and make him run and get him into the defense and he was not there. But the difference is he has been able to switch on the engine and get going. And once he get going, it's very difficult to stop. So that's probably all the help from Darren to to explain to him that there is some element of his game that he has to improve if he wants to get to the top. Obviously, you have to put the work together as well on and off the court. And then mentally being able to put it together for three, four, five hours or how long it takes for you to win the match. So. Um, for me, that has been the three major, major improvements he has done. We all knew the forehand and the serve always been there, but the way, the rest was lacking and that was stopping him into some set of the tournaments because top players were able to expose those issues when now they become smaller and smaller. Now, we've seen his mental strength on the court. A lot was said about the addition and, and you touched on in there of coach Darren Cahill to his team. And as you can hear here, and this was from his post-final press conference in Australia, he was already thinking about what's next. I'm extremely happy that I am in this position now. Um, I have a great team behind me who who knows what I have to do. Um, with Darren, he has a lot of experience. He he has been through this uh, already numbers of time. Um, Simone, who we were talking already after the after the match, that we can improve still. Um, so it's you know it's. It's all part of the process. Obviously, having this trophy, it's it's an amazing feeling. I I, I feel grateful to have this here, um, but I know that I have to work uh, even even harder because the opponents they will find a the way to to beat me, and I have to be prepared. So, let's see what's coming in the future. Now, Marion, if I won a Grand Slam title, I would go out and party probably <laughs> for the rest of the year. Now, photos. <laughs> show us that Yannick Sin is already back in the gym. Now, I know 40 days after you won Wimbledon, you made the announcement that you were going to retire. But what did you do in the immediate aftermath of winning that Wimbledon title? Tell me you went out and let your hair down and partied. I wish I could tell you that, but I was like, OK, let, let's get ready for Stanford. And then my team was like, Marianne, you have five blister under each feet. You can barely walk now. So you have to take at least one week off when you can we can treat those blisters and you can recover from your feet because we can't even train you anymore properly. So the thing is, um, I'm going to try to explain to you, but it, it, it's hard to desiccate what your mind is telling you because you're so high. The emotion are so high that you feel invincible. So you feel you can take on, you could have told me, okay, Marion, tomorrow you're going to climb the Everest. I was like, yeah, of course, let's go. Where is it? Just put me there. <laughs> Give me the gear and let's do it. Um, you know, you feel you're on the top of the world. No one can touch you. You can achieve anything you want. And and you feel literally invincible. So that's where you feel like you're going to take on any challenge. Your coach is going to tell you, oh, yeah, you have to improve that. You're like, yeah, of course. Let me do it on the practice for tomorrow. Um, there is a part of you that tells you that. And there is a part of your body that needs a time to process what you have done. Um, that needs a time to recover before you can reload and then be ready for the next challenge. And once again, what for me has been extraordinary when I look at Rafa and Roger and Novak is to see how much I've been able to go through that process over and over and over again and deliver over and over and over again. And it's very, very difficult to separate those two emotions that you're going through because you want more, you want so much to feel that again, that you're ready to take on any number of hours on the court, any number of hours on the gym. Nothing makes you feared um, or makes you feel like it's going to be too much. You're ready for anything. Your coach can tell you tomorrow you're going to run 10K every single morning before breakfast. You'll be, of course, let me, let me do it. <laughs> um, but there is a part of your body that needs recovery. And that's where it's very important to have a team around you that has been going through those experience with other players. And obviously Darren has been going through that with um, the Grand Slam titles he has been able to win with other players because you have to separate those two emotions. 
So there will be a part of you that will be ready to take on anything. And there will be a part of you that needs to recover, that needs to shut down, that needs to do something different. You know, for Yannick, he loves skiing. He might be going some down some slope and do some skiing. You need to cut at some point because if you don't, the next tournament will come and you think you're ready mentally and actually you're empty. There is nothing in you that is ready to fight again. And, and you need that fight. I mean, as much as you feel good and you hit the ball well, if you take away the fight, it's very difficult to win the matches. It's very difficult to be the top player. So um, that's probably where, you know, he's going to be pulled into that cycle and that washing machine that takes you from meeting the prime minister to meeting that VIP person to then going to that sponsor photo shoot to then going to do that cover of magazine photo shoot and this and that and whatever. But you need some time off. You need some time when there is no press, nothing, nobody. You go in a place when you feel it's safe for you, when you feel you can recharge your battery, and then you go back again into uh, the circus of the ATP tour. But if you're not able to cut, you're going to pay the price at some point mentally. Someone you feel needs time to recover is is Medvedev. You said at the very start, you know, it's the second time he was in that position in the final Australia. It was his third final overall. It were, He spent over 24 hours on court across the two weeks. But what for me about Medvedev is how well he speaks. The pain he must have been feeling. He came into press. He can have a little bit of humour. He can, he can I, I have no doubt that he will bounce back and come back stronger. Yeah, I mean... I love Daniel. Um, he has such a great personality. He has such a fun character. And what is the most interesting about him and is is just telling you what he feels. You know, there is no hide. There is no sort of speech that a communication agency told him to say. It just tells you how he feels. And whether you like it or you don't, or whether the agents say, oh, maybe you should have said, you should have not said that the way you did. It just tells you what he feels. And um, that is for me, the best way to behave, because at the end of the day, then you feel you're expressing yourself and not someone else or a picture of yourself that someone tells you to be. Um, I mean, obviously, in some sort of ways, you can see it as a positive because you should have been not in the final. Um, already against Ruzuvori, it was on the brink of losing. Against Verev, I don't even know how he turned out the match around. Um, so to be in the final, you feel it's already almost a bonus. But then you're so close because you're up to sets to love. So you can see in both ways. But for me, he's getting closer and closer. Obviously, Novak at some point is going to retire. He's the one with the most complete games on a hard court, probably after Novak. So he will have multiple chances along the way to win other US Open, to win other Australian Open. I would say the two other surfaces, which are grass and clay court, is probably the toughest challenge for him. Um, so that's where. I don't know if even on clay, sometimes he's going to be able to master it, even though he won the Masters 1000 in Roma. But you just feel like on clay with Alcaraz and all those big guns, um, it's going to be maybe more difficult to win Roland Garros. But on grass, I feel with this flat game, if he's just able to, I don't know, keep that gap from the base on a little shorter, he will be able <laughs> to find a way on grass because if he keeps on playing from the fans, it's going to be slightly more difficult. But on the hard court, Absolutely, he would have multiple chance um, to win the US Open, and I'm sure he will leave that trophy in the Australian Open at some point down the road, absolutely. There was a lot of talk about his court positioning over the two weeks in the Australian Open. He went back, he came forward, he was stubborn, he stayed back. So have a listen to what Medvedev had to say on the subject of changing his style of play. Maybe, yeah. Uh, that's something I worked a little more in preseason. I'm getting older, that's True, I'm still very young, but you know, if we were, if we look at Novak or other big champions, when maybe in the beginning of their career we could say they're a little bit defensive or something like this, I feel like all of them that wanted to go higher and higher and wanted to stay on the top of the sport when they uh, get older, they try to do it. So I uh, will see if I can try to do it. My wallet was pretty impressive this uh, this tournament, and I'm happy about it. So. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I can do it more often. I still think uh, the main core of my game is going to stay, try to put as many balls in the court, uh, make my opponent work. But if physically I'm not feeling well this day or if tactically I feel like that's the thing, I'm going to try to make it more. Yeah. 
It's true. His volley was pretty good. And I think the other thing is all the greats have continued to evolve throughout their career. So he's definitely got the right men- mindset and he's thinking the right way. Absolutely. But it's actually the way he turned the match around against Verev. That's because he came to the net. Because they had, at the back end of that second set, those two rallies. I mean, one was 50-plus ball and one was 60-plus ball. I don't know if people imagine going 60 balls side to side, the speed those guys are playing. It's just like, I don't know how you can breathe after that. I mean, your lungs, your, your, your legs, everything is on absolute fire. And Zverev was able to win those, those points at the end of the second set. Get that second set. You felt he has done the toughest. And then all of a sudden, then he's changed his game style completely, come to the net a lot more often. And, and Sasha is not able to find a way to hit a passing shot over him. Um, so that was for me to see him completely changing the tactic during the match, being completely down. And as he said, he had some amazing bodies. He was able to have some really good touch. Um, I didn't expect that from Daniel, to be honest. I never saw him doing that so dramatically and so drastically different. Um, so it's definitely an aspect of his game that I feel he can use a lot more, especially on grass. I mean, to come back to the grass, on grass, if he's able to come to net a lot more, hit those volleys, hit those drop shots, he will be a m- much bigger threat for the rest of the field and staying three, four meters behind the baseline. Of course, you have a tendency to always come back to what feels comfortable. And for him, it's just making his opponent hit a lot of balls, making them work, making them run and sort of um, out-fitness them in some sort of ways. But I think if he's able, especially on the grass, to sure turn those points, to come to the net a lot more. That's absolutely the way if you want to win there. I mean, if you want to win the center court of Wimbledon, it's not by hitting the ball and when your racket is about to touch the, the judge line just behind you. So I think for me, that's that's great to see him actually doing that in the match against the toss players because if you're able to do that against Veres who hit the ball so hard, you will be able to do it against the majority of the players on the other side of the net. So... Um, absolutely a, a bonus for him and absolutely something he has to carry on doing. I just want to take a couple of minutes to look ahead to what's coming up because tennis is is like this juggernaut. It keeps going. That There is no stopping for Medvedev. He won Doha and Dubai last year. So that's a lot of yep. points to defend. On the, on the women's side, Iga Shiontek has a lot of points. She won Doha. She was, she was a runner-up in Dubai. Then we get the sunshine double. I mean, this is, Marin, this is the constant pressure of tennis the rankings reset and if you did well you've got to try and keep up and and get back to that level no absolutely i mean i feel for me the best approach um is to think that you're starting from zero every season and you have to earn a certain amount of points to qualify for the year's end championship and you know roughly how many points you have to get to qualify for the year's end championship and is about getting those points, whether you're getting them at the same events or whether you're getting them at other places, it really doesn't matter. But I don't think by having the approach to defend something, you're actually going to perform well because already it's a defending mindset. And once you have a defensive mindset, it's very difficult to go and perform and, and taking the right decision at the right moment and taking some risk at the right moment as well. When you feel, okay, I'm starting from zero, I have to win and earn my place in the final for Grand Slam or as a Grand Slam winner or as a year-end uh, Masters qualifier, whatever you want to set your goals to, the mindset is already different because you're starting from zero. You can just rely on the experience you had from the previous years being able to do it. But it's just not your feeling like, oh my God, if I don't defend my title in Doha, then I'm going to lose that much point, then I'm going to lose my ranking. Then this It's already so negative. Um, that is very difficult for the for your brain to process that. If you feel okay, um, you know I can possibly, if I perform well, win one thousand points in Indian Wells, one win one thousand point in Miami, win one thousand points uh, wherever else, and out of that I will wish to win maybe I don't know two thousand out of three thousand possible. Then you're trying to earn something, and the mindset is completely different. And I think from what I heard from Marina Sabalenka as well, and what she was saying before the Australian Open. That was pretty much the mindset she was having as well, because everyone was saying, okay, you're, you have to defend a Grand Slam title for the first time if you're in your career. How are you going to approach that it's a different situation from you? And she was saying, well, I don't feel I have to defend something. I just feel I have to win the Australian Open. And, and, and that is a winner approach. It's a lot easier for your brain to process. 
Yeah, and going forward, Sabalenka didn't play Doha last year. She was quarter final in Dubai. And we have to remember when it gets the Sunshine Double, Novak Djokovic wasn't allowed into America at that time last year. So he will have no points to depend, defend going into there. Now, we like to have a couple of minutes talking and putting the spotlight on Roland Garros. In the first podcast, we talked about the new roof on Susan Longland and how fabulous that's going to be. Something else that's going to be new this year is... mobile ticketing. So I don't know what you're like with bits of paper. We have accreditation round our neck. It it hangs there. It's great. It hangs there because I don't lose it. But Marion, this time, one app, one ticket, everything for the fan is just going to be in one place. I think that's great. And and once again, it's uh, it's an innovation we have to take and the turn we have to take. Uh, Everything is going paperless. Uh, Let's face it. Even cash. I mean, people don't carry cash anymore. You just pay with your phone or pay with your credit card, but you don't even have pre proper money anymore <laughs> in your hands. So it's absolutely even easier for the fans because sometimes you feel like if you have your paper ticket and you lose it and it slip out of your pocket or, you know, you can forget it somewhere. At least it's in your phone. It's in there. You can have the best experience out of wrong hours. You don't have to worry about making sure you don't lose a paper or anything like that. And you can just enjoy your day at wrong hours. I think they have... Um, those tickets are going to give you access to more courts and more possibilities to stay inside Roland Garros as well, which is obviously what you want as a tournament director for Amelie Moresmo is having people to have the best experience possible to make the most of out of the euros they have spent uh, to get those tickets um, and and to come back possibly the next day or the next year. So you want to really have uh, the best possible fan experience. I know um, they have been. Uh, having tremendous, um, I think, renovation of, of Roland Garros over the years. When you look now at the pathway towards Court Simon Mathieu, all those uh, great food service you can have on the side, even those seats when you can watch that gigantic screen and watch the matches. I think, you know, even if you're coming as a family, you don't feel like you're only walking all day into Roland Garros and trying to find a seat to watch the match. You feel you're actually you're in the green, you can watch those beautiful uh, flowers in that botanical garden and then you can watch a bit of tennis and you can lie down rest recover have a drink and watch some tennis on the screen i think the fan experience over the years has been improving so so much um that is just i mean when you listen to the comments of the people they just have the best time of their life when they come to our girls right oh yeah you're making me hungry for the waffle for the crepes for the <laughs> you want some crepes are... and some waffle with chocolate oh, <laughs> Oh, my, just don't. I just, oh, Marion, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I look forward to seeing you very soon because we're going to be working on the WT event in Doha. Absolutely, Gigi. Thank you so much for having me. Marion Bartley, it's been an absolute pleasure. And that is it from Courtside Conversations. Thank you for your company. When we return, there'll be a sunshine double of Indian Wells and Miami to reflect on, a first part of the season to assess and our clay build-up will begin with Roland Garros firmly in our sights. But until next time, bye for now. Thank you so much. Peace, Gigi.